Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Hello. What's going on? Okay, I guess, I guess it's recording. I hope it is. Okay, it's recording. Okay, so what chapter is this? Chapter 23, and it's on growth and development. And uh, medically, there's a difference between growth and development. Growth is increase in size, therefore, increase in cell number. Of course, so if you have a bigger child, you're going to have more cells. Makes sense. But development, which is the important part of both uh, obstetrics, neonatology, and pediatrics. I don't know why I said both. Those are three things. It's not only the growth, but there are stages. And um, even a fetus and, of course, the child have to meet those stages. So that's development. So you have the prenatal period. That's from fertilization to birth. And typically, it's in a 40-week 40, 40 cycle, and that's called age of gestation or AOG, how long, you know, uh, the baby's in their development. And of course, the postnatal period is everything after death. Perinatal, uh, um, also known as, well, I'll get to that when we get to that. But the perinatal period is everything that happened on the, the date of birth. So that's also equally important because the stuff that happened to you on the date of birth also dictates um, the rest of the development in the postnatal period, which is from birth um, uh, to, of course, your eventual death. We already know fertilization. That's the secondary oocyte meets the sperm cell. And we already know that that, that happens in the uh, uh, fallopian tube. And more specifically, in the infundibulum, uh, which is the uh, latter third uh, of the fallopian tube. You know where the, the the, um, the distal part where it has the, the horn and the fimbriae. Fimbrae. That's where fertilization takes place. Now, fertilization, the sperm has to travel and it, um, it has to get to a site of implantation. And then we're going to look at this, the site of implantation. Let me make this a little bit larger. is typically here in the corpus of the uterus. So the infundibulum is that um, expanded area. You know, when we were looking at the anatomage, the thing that looked kind of like a horn on the end, and inside they have fimbrae, and that helps uh, coax the ovum from your, uh, well, not, not really the ovum, more specifically, the secondary oocyte from your mature graphene follicle here and go, that gets released day 14 of your 28-day cycle. Now, what else is important? We already learned because of the menstrual cycle that sperm survives 24 to 48 hours. Now, the oocyte has 12 to 24 hours after ovulation. So that's why when we're talking about the rhythm method, we're always talking about plus or minus two days. Not only for viability of the sperm, but viability of the oocyte as well, okay? And some of you swimmers are really fast because a sperm can reach uh, the infundibulum of the fallopian tube within an hour at fastest. But remember, sperm is viable up to 48 days. I'm sorry, 48 hours, not days. 48 days, you've got a problem, okay? So, and there can be anywhere from 200 to 600 million of them uh, uh, within the ejaculation. But remember, the majority of them are going to get hit by the sheer distance that um, the sperm has to travel. The majority of them are going to get hit by the slightly acidic environment of your vaginal canal. Some of them are also going to get gummed up in the um, <coughs> mucosal lining of the vaginal canal. And then some of them are just simply not going to make it because remember, does the sperm have a brain? It just swims in a general direction. So some of it will just end up in the vaginal canal and just keep on swimming towards the wall and not make it. But typically, only one sperm 
should fertilize only one uh, oocyte. That's normal, right? But then when you get twins and stuff like that, sometimes you got two sperm, two eggs and stuff, but we're only looking at normal. Question. Um, you said that sperm survives for uh, 48 hours? Yeah. So is that wrong where it says that it can survive for six days? <laughs> Typically it's 48. It's like, uh, because that's why we have the, um, the uh, when we, like back in the day when we used to train, um, the, the majority of the viability is usually 48 hours. Yeah, it can do six days, but that's why it's only plus or minus two days. And it wouldn't matter anyway, because let's say you had super sperm and you survived a week. Ovum's only good for what? Day, right? But viability typically is about 48 hours for sperm to meet ovum. So oh. there's a question for 48. Yeah. Okay. So that's why when they teach the rhythm method, it's always ovulation plus or minus two days. Yeah. But yeah, you could survive. But uh, we're looking also at the survivability of what? Both the egg and the sperm for fertilization. Mm -hmm. right. So this is a more important number, 12 to 24 hours. But now you know where some of those numbers come from when we talk about the rhythm method and why we talk about plus or minus two days upon ovulation or, you know, viability of pregnancy. Uh, we all know these parts. Um, this is, and if you look at the ovum here, you see how the secondary oocyte is actually, it's not just this round ball, it's, it's got a, it's got a fibrous covering, and we're going to talk about the coverings in a minute. Because remember, only one egg can get, I mean, only one sperm can get into one egg. And it makes sense. How many chromosomes in one sperm? 23. How many chromosomes are in one egg? 23. 23 plus 23, 46. You have a whole human being. So you, you can now see the problem if more than one sperm gets in there. You could also see the problem if there was more than one egg floating around. If there was more than one egg floating around, you have a couple of million sperm. You're going to get what? Two. Two fetuses. But like I stated before, multiple pregnancies um, to laypersons, it's cute, it's really cool. But to medical personnel, it's high risk. A, a female anatomy is only geared for one baby. And <clears throat> is never a good thing. Because uh, one of the twins is going to suffer. And if it's triplets, it's even worse. So you can only imagine people have septuplets and stuff like that, uh, how obstetrics cringes about it. But then you look at media like, oh, this is so wonderful. No, it's not. Because um, uh, you know that John, uh, John and Kate, whatever. Right? Um, um, Kate had uh, fertility issues, so she uh, took... Um, what do you call it? She took meds to, uh, of course, to have multiple ovum because if you have fertility issues, you want you want to have multiple ovum for, you know, uh, multiple viability. But if you look at who's the oldest one, Maddie, and then the other little girls, if you uh, if you look at their uh, history, uh, all of them have what significant both physical and mental issues, all of them, and it's and 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 even though they said it's the show, but even if they didn't have the show, they would have all the same issues. Now, you see this thing here. This is fibrous covering. Because we just don't want any Joe sperm coming in here or Jana sperm. I don't know um, uh, their primary sexual characteristics yet. It has to first get through that thick layer. And that thick outer layer is the corona radiata. Now, in order to get through the corona radiata, the sperm right here on its head, we already know what's in the backpack or the body. It has prostaglandin, and it also has uh, fructose. And the tail, of course, that's going to be its locomotion and moving around. This head right here has the 23 chromosomes that we love. But what is, what is the sperm wearing? The sperm is wearing a cap. And that cap is called an acrosome. And that acrosome has enzymes to break through the first layer, which is the corona radiata. So think of corona as what? Crown? 
So it's got to be the outer layer. And as you can see from this photo, it's fibrous, it's tough. It's not going to let things in. So the sperm have to burrow their way in. Now, the cool part is once the sperm gets in and it gets beyond the corona radiata, which is the outer part, there's an area in here that's lucid or clear, and that's called your zona pellucida. Now, this is the cool part. Once the sperm gets in, the zona pellucida detects what? 23 chromosomes plus the uh, eggs, 23 chromosomes. You now have fertilization. In order for uh, to prevent the other sperm from coming in, this zona pellucida here, this light blue lucid area, then hardens. It changes its chemical transformation, and then what? Closes the doors to everybody else. So, like I stated before in laboratory, we're all champion swimmers. Number one out of 200 to 600 million applicants, but there's only one that made it. And now you can see what happens immediately um, um, once you have 23 chromosomes and 23 chromosomes. You will then get what? A whole 46. And then we have what we also know and love as mitosis because now I'm building a whole body, okay? A whole living thing. So, mm, yeah, pronuclei is what the, the nucleus of the sex cells getting together. But what's more important now? 23 chromosomes of 23 is 46. So this is a complete thing, 2N, and this thing is now called a zygote. So it's not no longer called a separate sperm, a separate secondary oocyte. They are now called a zygote, and the zygote has 46 or 2N uh, chromosomes. So that's why when this thing starts, uh, starts separating and start, uh, starts growing and developing, so we start with 46 chromosomes, then we're going to do more somatic cells. So we're going to end up with what? More mitosis, 46 chromosomes. <clears throat> uh, prenatal period, anywhere from 38. And uh, we try not to stretch it beyond 42 weeks because statistically, after 42 weeks, there's no, there's no advantage for the baby to, to stay in there longer. And then after 42 weeks, it becomes a detriment to mommy especially if the baby's big or macrosomic. Um, Pre-embryonic stage, embryonic stage, and of course your fetus. But right now, uh, we're at like uh, week one, age of gestation, and it's called, uh, it first starts called a zygote. In the next couple of hours, the zygote then cleaves or, or starts uh, doing mitosis. And remember mitosis, what are we doing? We keep on doubling up all the DNA to make more what? More somatic cells. So the first set of cleavage is called the blastomere because what uh, a developing cell is called a blast cell. Then you get about 16 cells. So two cells become four, four become eight, eight become 16. And that 16 cells is called the marula. Now, once it gets 16 cells, it starts having some weight to it. So now it starts floating towards the uh, body of the uterus where it should attach. When it attaches, there's a hollow ball of cells that will attach uh, the marula onto the uh, endometrium of the uterus, and that's called the blastocyst. And this is what's going to happen. You're going to start seeing, right? You got your, your marula, your blast cells, right? And doesn't this kind of look like the, the, uh, the graphene follicle? And then we had the egg in the middle, right? Remember that, right? It's the egg in the middle that was the important thing. So just like the egg in the middle, that's an important thing. If you look at here, what's now the important thing on this marula? Right? It's in the inside. And who's all the supporting cells? 
all on the outside. So the inner cell mass, this stuff, the stem cells, these blast cells, right? They become the embryo. And the covering and the fluid and all the stuff and also all the supporting structures is going to be this blastocyst. So think this blue, that's going to be baby. And these beige are going to be um, the um, placenta. Now, you'll notice that it has to dig into here, you know, just like a root, just like a plant needs roots, because these blastocysts are going to feed this, uh, uh, this future fetus, and it has to be deep in there. And that's when, remember when we talked about how some women, they, they, they have what they think is their menstrual cycle? I mean, it was what? It was implantation bleed from uh, the blastocyst. So the blastocyst, of course, has proteolytic enzymes. Uh, and uh, what are they breaking down? Uh, they're breaking down some of the proteins of the endometrium so they can do what? They develop microvilli. What's villi? Even if you look at the word, it looks like little fingers. And if we looked at this picture, do you see how it's like, starting to encroach and starting to like grow roots. So that's microvilli. Now, um, oh, here's a little better picture. So these microvilli and these outer cells are called your trophoblast. Trophol means growth. Now, the thing in the blue is going to be the inner cell mass. That's going to develop into the embryo, right, or the fetus. But everything on the outside, that's going to be part of the placenta. And also, uh, there's we're going to be talking about things that surround the baby and then protect the baby. So when you look at it, doesn't doesn't that also sound like the theme of remember we had neurons, nerve cells, and we had um, uh, astrocytes, which are supporting cells. Well, that's what these trophoblasts are. That's what this blastocyst uh, um, is. They're supporting cells for what? The inner cell mass, which is the embryo. And, and, and blast always means like precursor, or another word you'll also hear in typical literature is stem cells. And this is why people are very interested in um, fetal growth and development, because just imagine if we can control stem cells. That means I can make any organ I want. And it won't be a problem because it's my genetics that I'm making it from. Did anyone here uh, save cord blood for their baby? Uh, I, I did it for, for giggles or uh, for two of my kids. Just to, you know, just to see. So if it's really real and if they're ever to, um, to, to get better technology in the next 20 years, uh, my two oldest ones are gonna have uh, really cool advantages. And the other, the other four are just going to be, I mean, well, whatever. But I did it as an experiment just to see if, you know, because it was, it was what? It was the, it was the early, late 90s, and I was just interested. But honestly, I just did it for giggles. I still start. I still, I still pay a monthly on it. But honestly, if you have that stuff, it still won't. If you have any genetic issues or anything, it won't really save the baby. But it's nice for also research purposes as well. So we now see, let's go back to this. We now know that trophoblasts think what? Supporting the embryo, supporting the inner cell mass. And this whole entire thing is called the blastocyst. Part of the trophoblast is going to form microvilli that's going to connect into the arteries and veins of your endometrium. And that's why the implantation location is just as important as fertilization because Yes, you may have fertilization, but baby can't grow without blood. You see here, the endometrium, lots of blood vessels. So that's going to feed baby or embryo. Now, this trophoblast, the stuff on the brown stuff on the outside that's going to be uh, your future placenta, well, it secretes something called HCG. HCG is human chorionic gonadotropin. 
and it does several things. Um, I'm, I'm skipping ahead so we can put everything together in our HCG box. So number one, HCG definitely is a screening test to tell us that mommy's pregnant. If you have any level of HCG, nine times out of 10, if you have HCG in your urine, HCG in your blood, what does it mean? You're pregnant. It means that there's a trophoblast and it's kicking out this hormone. Now, another thing that uh, HCG will do is keep the corpus luteum viable. And do you remember the corpus luteum or luteum, potato, potato? It's in the second half of the menstrual cycle. So what if I just let the second half of the menstrual cycle keep on running and I never went back to the first half? Remember when we talked about progesterone? If it keeps on going, will you have a menstrual cycle? No. So guess what tells the progesterone to keep on going? HCG lets the corpus luteum keeps it alive. If the corpus luteum is alive that, and it doesn't go to the corpus albicans and it doesn't get recycled, then guess what? you have a menstrual cycle? No. And what will happen to your endometrium? It'll stay nice and thick for the next 40 weeks. And that's what we want. Another thing that HCG does, it will suppress FSH and LH. That makes sense, right? Do I need ovulation during these 40 weeks? Nope. And of course, the trophoblast that's connected to the endometrium, of course, that's the go-between uh, baby and mommy and that'll form the placenta. And that's where gas exchange and waste exchange will occur between embryo and mommy. And that's part of this part here, the trophoblast. And here's another view. Here's the implanted um, um, uh, trophoblast. You have the embryo inside. And do you see how close it is to all these arteries and veins? It is very close, and that's what we want. And you look at the endometrium. Isn't it nice and thick, just like the second half of your menstrual cycle? And if HCG is working, FSH, LSH is suppressed, and progesterone is at a nice even level, you're going to have what? In 40 weeks, a nice thick, right? And that's where we get the word fertility from. A nice fertile area to feed who? The growth and development of this order, um, uh, of this blastocyst. Chorionic villi, we already know, those irregular spaces in the endometrium, see all these spaces that has all the arteries and veins in it? Those are called lacunae, right? Uh, and lacunae is just a Latin term for like cave or hold. We also have lacunae in our, um, our bones. Now, we already know that what's going to be the placenta, the trophoblast, this brown stuff. What's going to be the, the fetus, the blue embryoblast? We already know this. Well, what we now also know is there's going to be two sacks or two layers or two bags that will protect baby. You're going to have chorion in the amnion. And the first thing that they talk about is the amnion. So the amnion is going to be the inner bag that covers baby. And the inner bag is going to have fluid where baby gets to sit in. It's not only a protective function. Remember we talked about the gas exchange and, um, and the waste exchange? That's going to go all throughout this amniotic fluid. So think what? Inner membrane right? Those that's surrounding directly associated to baby is the, uh, the amnion. And within that, it has the amniotic fluid. So that's why when we do an amniocentesis, we tap mommy. It tells us a lot about what? What's going on with baby? Because the amniotic fluid is the, uh, uh, the, most, uh, the most intimately associated with the fetus. Now, Remember we talked about the chorion, right? Let's go back to this picture yet once again. See the trophoblast? Baby's inside here in their own little sac. Don't you think there's gonna be another sac? It's gonna be formed on the outside. 
and that sac is called your chorion, right? So you have two sacs. The inner one is amnion associated with the baby. The chorion will be what? Associated with the placenta and uh, the support staff. So you could, not support staff, but all the supporting cells um, of the placenta. So when you look at it, yet another theme of our body not having one, not only one protective layer, two protective layers, and both filled with fluid. That's why in, um, in EMS, how many times I had mommy take a really bad fall? I had, oh, one suicide attempt. Mommy tried to throw herself down a flight of uh, stairs. Um, um, tell me first. Did anything happen to baby? Nope. Why? Baby's covered in a double sack fed directly uh, um, into the placenta and is all covered in fluid. Um, I also had another call where a woman, she was trying to, she was in the middle of a domestic. And this is the horrible part. It was her sister's domestic. And she got in between it and uh, she was struck several times with a bat uh, in the abdominal area. And she was six months pregnant. Cool. Anything happened to baby? Nope. Mommy got a couple of nice uh, broken ribs out of it. But baby was what? Miraculously fine because of these things, it's in a water, it's in a, uh, it's in a uh, aqueous environment. So it just like, do we also notice where we had that as well? We have that in our brain. Your brain is very important. So what do we do? We packed it all in water, so it's not floating. So if something hits my skull, it doesn't hit my brain directly as a nice little uh, protective feature. Now, this stuff that we saw here is eventually gonna start looking like this. Now it makes a little bit more sense now that you have, right, the outer layer, chorion, and then you have your inner layer, amnion, right, where the blue part is where the baby will uh, develop. So the amnion will cover this inner part, and the chorion will be on the outside. So what's so important about these membranes? It's coming. Okay. Right? You have your yolk sac, and of course, that's going to, uh, if we looked at the yolk sac here, go back to this picture here, you can see right underneath it. So what is what do we always know about yolk being? Yolk is like what? The protein, it gives, it, it's like the, uh, the bulk of uh, the material that when you look at an egg, right? So that yolk sac is going to be a, a part and parcel of the embryo. Now, the developmental part, see this like pink part here? Those are germ layers. And we already talked about germ cells, right? They're what? Sexual de uh, development. And they develop into three things. Endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm. So you look at this. What is ectoderm? <clears throat> Everything on the outside. Do you see an anamod when it's loading up? Do you see how like uh, the, um, the nervous system is developed totally different? Like you see that uh, when it starts loading up, it's really cool that uh, the brain and the brain and the spinal cord and the nerves are like separate from everybody else because isn't that really important? And all the skin things, you know we have external skin, of course, epidermal layer, and you have internal skin, which is all you know glands and all the linings. Mesoderm, I want you to take muscle and bone and blood. Muscle, bone, and blood, because that's where, everything in the middle. And then last but not least, endodermal, I want you to think GI and um, what's this thing called? Uh, genitourinary, GU tract. So ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. These are, uh, this is called gastrulation, meaning the germ cells start separating into parts. Right? And then, of course, these parts around week four, five, six, age of gestation, now become organogenesis. So what could I ask you? Hey, where does your skin come from? You'll tell me what? Ectodermal layer. Where does my bones and my muscles come from? Mesodermal layer. Where does my GI and my genital urinary tract come from? Endodermal layer. And they're all what? Associated with my fetus which is right here, part of the amnion, and of course the yolk sac, oopsies, the yolk sac, which, uh, uh, which 
all three of these things will eventually develop into a fetus. And then when you look at here, after a while, the yolk sac is starting to diminish, isn't it? Because it's getting, all the proteins in there are getting used up. Used up to make what? Now, you'll start seeing organogenesis. You'll start seeing an umbilical cord being formed. You'll start seeing, and you can now see how the placenta is actually part and parcel of mommy's endometrium. That's why if the placenta gets ripped out for whatever reason, for example, um, placenta previa, don't want that to happen. It's a consequence of really, really high blood pressure. And then, of course, it's really, really high blood pressure. It starts peeling out. It starts peeling out. Do you think fetus is going to get any blood? Fetus doesn't get any blood. It's a problem. This is what happened to my nephew, CJ. Four minutes. The center preview of four minutes. They solved the problem in four minutes. CJ can't talk. Um, he's what? What is he now? Three years younger than Chanel. He's 21. Uh, still has to wear diapers. Doesn't communicate, right? And um, just by what? Four minutes. So now you know how viable and how important the placenta is as being the go between you and baby. And that's why perinatal get kind of tense and kind of excited because you can have 40 weeks age of gestation, beautiful, beautiful. Actually, CJ was my cousin's first child. And all through, uh, goes, um, I was in medical school when he was born. Uh, no, I was already a resident. All throughout the 40 weeks, it was almost textbook. Like we're, I'm, I was telling her, oh, you're gonna, this is going to be a great kid. Everything's going to be wonderful. Every, and um, uh, his, uh, his father and his mother, they're small people, right? They're typical Filipinos. They're not too big people. But CJ, his growth chart was at least P60, P70. That means he was going to be what? Going to be beautiful American-sized baby because of four minutes. Dictated what? The rest of his life. Which is what? Now, this is a nice also picture that shows the different germ layers on, uh, you know, how they're separated out. Looks like a beautiful question. Now, what's a teratogen? Factors that cause malformation affecting the embryo during periods of rapid growth. So around the time of fertilization, rapid growth. You saw in a couple of days, you have 16 cells, 32 cells, 64 cells, very, very quickly. And remember I told you organogenesis starts around week four, five, six. So during those weeks, do you think mommy should be exposed to anything? Nope. Don't want, don't want them around uh, certain things. And you'll learn in obstetrics, there's certain things that you don't want mommy around because they will cause malformations. But that's what a teratogen does. Because if my baby gets exposed to something that's gonna mess up the development, it's gonna be during those times. And you can see the picture, you can see like the beginnings of organogenesis. It looks more like a tadpole than a human being. Then, then it starts looking like an alien. You know that movie, Aliens? That's what it looked like to me. It looks like a dinosaur. Uh, now, you see these little things, these little boxes at the end? Everyone sees those? When we do an ultrasound, we count those. Another thing we also count is the amount of amniotic fluid. Because remember, that's what baby lives in. So we can't have too little fluid, we can't have too lot of fluid. And if I'm also measuring mommy's fundic height, I'm also measuring the number of somites, soma, body, Height means what? Small. So these small little bodies, which will eventually be your vertebral canal. And you can see in the beginning, they look like tadpoles, don't they? But then little by little by little, and look at the size of their head. Right? And why, just as a little uh, precursor, why are toddlers, their head is so big? Why are their tummy so big? Because that's their... Um, that's their focus of um, of development. Don't you think their heads are growing because there's a lot of brain tissue growing and their tummies are growing because their GI is developing? 
You guys don't. You guys don't little kids. They eat. They eat a lot. Now, when we look at this nice little chart, you don't have to memorize it. Right? You look. Where did it all start? See, these are nine months. When did it all start? Month one. So that's what week four, five, six, seven. In obstetrics, it's week four through nine. Those are the big days. But look, look at look at central nervous system. It's so important that it's what? It's the entire development, the whole entire time. And uh, neurology and pediatric neurology says this continues all the way until age of six. By the time they're five or six years old, uh, the child um, then has um, uh, solidified. Not to say that you can't teach a kid any more things, but um, you totally ramp up what you teach your child before age of six. You get them into, you know, uh, the gamification of learning. You get, uh, and I know as a parent, it's so annoying hearing the same eight songs every day, but it sticks and um, uh, they learn. Um, so the fetal stage, uh, we kind of saw this and it makes sense. Everything is going to go. Now, uh, when we look at this uh, chart here, this is also another reason why mommy can't be exposed to any drugs because can drugs also be a teratogen? And it's also the reason why in this country it takes years to develop um, develop drugs because in the 60s there was this drug called thalidomide and it was a really really popular uh, um, contraceptive. But Europe and the United States at the time they're really fast to approve drugs so they can make money, right? <clears throat> so it went through the process and they didn't look at long term until they started noticing that, you know, these limb buds. You have the little, they have little limb buds. Well, the thalidomide was a teratogen towards limb buds. And then um, all the baby, all the mommies who were taking thalidomide in the 60s, in the late 60s, all the children were started to be born with, um, with no arms or legs. They only had limb buds because they found out later through a longer study that that drug thalidomide was a teratogen for development. We're also, when you look at this, look, look how big their heads are. Freaky. And then look at their tummies. Okay? Big their tummies are. And then, uh, and then they get that weird thing when they're like four or five years old. Their metabolism is so fast. Those of you who have children, you know, it's like they eat so much, but they don't gain any weight. And sometimes you think they're sick or, um, but, um, because my babies, when they were little, eat so much now, I'm not, I'm not quite sure the, if the five-year-old even eats anymore. I just see him with random cookies every once in a while. <laughs> but now it's getting what? It's getting like uh, really thinner. Also, remember I mentioned regarding puberty, uh, tanner stages? Those are the stages of, uh, of breast development. Now, remember I, I mentioned that all of us were the same before week four, age of gestation, because during week four, we're just uh, growing, uh, the, the genetics won't kick in yet. But around week four, the genetics has to kick in yet because what has to be created? The reproductive system. And the reproductive system, if it's XX, has to go one pathway, if it's X, Y, they have to go to another pathway. So all of us at week three, week two, age of gestation, add these things. So they, you didn't have either a vagina or a penis or anything. They were ubiquitous. It means it could go either way. But then what happens during organogenesis? Let me make this larger. During organogenesis, the male or the Wolfian pathway Right? The glands over here will start developing what? The glands penis, the head of the penis. Then these grooves will start folding, and that's all that organogenesis is. It's like fancy cellular origami. So you can see here that it will start, start, start for, uh, folding, uh, folding and making the shaft, 
right? And then, of course, uh, we'll, we'll start making scrotum and of course, develop what? Into uh, male reproductive organs. So look at the female, the bless, the clitoris, same as the rectal tissue here, right, as well. And the labia minora and majora are the same tissue as the scrotum. And then you, so, and then it develops different things, but they're coming from the same source. That's what I was trying to say in uh, the other lecture. So what are the homologs? Of course, the penis and the uh, clitoris, or the glands penis to be uh, specific, and the clitoris are homologs. Ovaries and testes, also homologs. And you can also see here, if you uh, 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 look at these uh, folds of your, they're called your labial scrotal folds because if you're female, it'll form your labia, or your labia minora and majora. And if you're male, it'll form the scrotum which is the sac that holds the testes. Let's now look at baby. Baby's almost cooked. We're about maybe, I don't know, 36, 35 weeks here. And um, my baby here is what they call vertex um, uh, lie presentation or cephalic presentation. You can see the placenta is uh, closely um, intimate with uh, mommy's uh, endometrium, and then you have your umbilical cord that has an umbilical artery and an umbilical vein. Now, remember we talked about how the pulmonary circulation is kind of backwards? Remember, pulmonary artery is what? Oxygenated or deoxygenated? Deoxygenated. Deoxygenated. De oxygenated. Pulmonary vein is oxygenated. Guess what? The umbilical artery is the same exact way because mommy is going this way, right? with her left ventricle and all that, but baby is going what? This way. So think of a um, fetal circulation as kind of backwards, <clears throat> where the umbilical vein goes is oxygenated and the umbilical artery is deoxygenated. And they both lie in the umbilical cord. So you can see here, the lie representation of the baby is important now, did you guys ever, like, did everyone ever tell you if this is, this is a breech baby, come out retarded? That was a thing, like, in second grade, we used to call each other breech babies, like, the, you a breech baby, you got a 50 on your quiz, or you a breech baby, you a mental, <laughs> right? It's something we, first and second grade, we're idiots, right? But no, but then, of course, stupid things like that pervade when you get, what, older. It's not the presentation. So they could be vertex or cephalic, boom, baby, yeah, wonderful. It could be breach, boom, baby out, wonderful. Lie that we don't like, transverse. Baby what? Sideways. Maybe sideways. So maybe go out. No, baby can't slide very well. So what do we got to do? Nope. Oh, turn no. You got to yeah. turn it. So I get a glove, fits all the way to my elbow. That's already bad sign. Right? And then I go what? I have the, oh, wrong side. I had the midwife or the nurse help me what? Yeah. Push over here and that gloved hand. And then I do what? I got to hook them. Yeah, it, I've only done it twice in my life and both times. Mommy was a trooper, but uh, everything, everything after that, she was okay with pain wise because she went through the roughest stuff ever. <laughs> but again, right? Yeah, we could do C-section, but if baby's already progressing and there's stages, you're gonna learn there's stations. This is a zero and this is um, negative one, negative two, plus one, plus two, depending on the anatomy. Well, if baby's already down there, uh, might not be not might be a good idea for C-section. And depending on baby size and stuff. And the way you do it is really neat. Go sit in there, right? And you can feel around and you find his armpit if he's like this way, right? If his head's like this way, I find an armpit and I do what? Hook him and turn him. Can't find an armpit, feel around, feel around, find, uh, find his knee. Then you take him and then you move around. And with the nurse's help, I go, okay, mommy, don't push, just relax. Stupidest thing to say, right? Because he's already, I got my, my arm in there. 
So she's already screaming. And then makes it worse, she has contractions and oh, I guess when we move, contractions move. So it will, it'll help us. We're pushing, I'm pulling, contractions. Oh, it's just, it's just a horrible, horrible show. But what are we doing? Getting baby to a position where baby can do what? See the slide? Wee. This will get nice and soft. Wee. And go for the ride and roll out. Okay. Now, that's also the other problem. We deliver baby, who else do we have to deliver? Placenta. Because remember the HCG? I forgot to mention. One of the things the HCG tells mommy's body is, is that baby and all these products, that's you. Please don't attack me. The second your baby's out, HCG stops. So what's it now? What what do you think mommy thinks is the placenta? Foreigner doesn't belong in there. We better get it out. That's why it's not done when baby goes out. Have to deliver the placenta and you have to deliver it completely. Now the placenta looks like a really effed up meat pie. And the pieces of that meat pie are called cotyledons. So when it comes out, you just don't do the newbie thing and push your, the placenta into the, the bucket. How many times I've had nurses and midwives do that to me and medical students. They get excited, like, ah, baby, I'm... and that's got to go to the lab. But before it goes to the lab, me, the person delivering, has to make sure all the cotyledons are there. Because if they're not, right, if there's a missing piece, and we're going to show you what that looks like in an atomage, remember that glove? Gotta go in. I've done that a lot. I've done that six or seven times. Because I'm looking at it, I'm looking at the placenta, it's not complete. Then I'm looking at mommy. Now she has significant bleeding for vagina. I'm like, mm. the bleeding should have stopped, shouldn't it? Because why? Didn't I take out the placenta? So everything should close up. That means there's a piece that still has the what? Arteries and veins open. So then you gotta go in and do what? Eight to six, nine to nine to six, twelve to three, and then uh, I mean twelve to three and twelve to nine, and then go back up and yeah, and then you have to analyze it. Where's the piece? You don't find it. We do surgery. Um, don't find it. That's what makes them settle hard. Yeah. Yeah. We do it in the DR because I want to know now. So we don't wait. Yeah, like why can't your placenta like your I don't know why people would want to do that, but you can use human beings all day, every day. But the placenta has what? All this a lot of things, but me medically, I don't see anything. And also, uh in other countries, uh I told you guys that when I was uh last time I was in my home country, I was helping some I was uh doing medical missions, but I just saw because at the time I was a smoker, so I was out back uh in the back of the delivery room. Here in America, everything goes to the lab, everything's all nice and clean. But I was in the province, I'm in the jungle. It's like a third world jungle. place, you know, it right? They're putting it in buckets and it got on a truck and then it drove somewhere. There's no tops on the That's buckets. So I'm sitting there just smoking cigarettes going, this looks shady as fudge, what's going on? And I asked the technician and technician goes with me, goes, he goes, he goes, oh, I don't know where it goes. They just pay me to put it on the truck. And then the truck went, I'm going, oh, I'm going to be so happy when I go back to my hospital here in the United States because there's a lot of creepy stuff I'm looking at. Now, don't you remember stem cells we talked about? Don't you think those placentas are very important for stem cell research? It has a lot of cord blood in it, which have uh, a lot of the stem cell properties. And remember, a stem cell or a blast cell can be anything. All you need is the genetics to tell it to what to do. But the problem is, you know, it's hard to come by. So when you look at this baby, it's got a lot of things going for it. A lot of things helping it out. Another thing that's helping it out, this is also the reason why mommy is almost always tired <coughs> and anemic. Fetal hemoglobin is way more sticky towards oxygen or has way more affinity towards oxygen than adult. So what's baby going to do to mommy's oxygen level? You're going to take it. And that's why mommy becomes has iron poor blood. That's why mommy becomes anemic. And that's perfectly normal. 
Remember the umbilical vein, umbilical artery? Now, you got three holes in your uh, in the fetal circulation. Remember I told you fetal circulation is backwards? The second baby is born, back in the day, in like the 60s and 70s, we used to tap the baby's butt so they would cry. You don't need to. The very fact that coming into a cold, very bright world is enough to um, initiate the baby to cry and to get upset. Or maybe they see me. Who knows? Either way. But remember, it's backwards. So everything has to then get kicked into forward. The very fact that the baby's crying is going to now change the pressures in both the cardiac and the pulmonary circuits to now make the baby go forwards. So how is the baby backwards? So let's look at the three holes that baby has that makes their circulation backwards. So if we're looking at this, look at this ugly, ugly child. Remember it's supposed to be red on the left? Why is it? Why is it purple? Because there's mixing of blood. Because if you see right here, right, your ductus arteriosus, right, is a connection in between your aorta and your pulmonary artery. So those, you can see, how the pulmonary artery is blue. It's supposed to be blue, but the aorta is kind of purple. So there's natural mixed blood in fetal circulation. Another one is your ductus venosus. So that's your ductus arteriosus. So there's a hole or connection in between your pulmonary artery and your aorta. That makes sense, arteriosus, aorta, pulmonary artery. How about your ductus venosus? <coughs> right? If you look at your ductus venosus right here, there's a hole in between your uh, umbilical vein, which is arterial, and there's a connection uh, to your um, uh, hepatic artery. Now, your hepatic artery is supposed to be what? Arteries are typically red. Why is this bad boy blue? And look, the inferior vena cava as well. It's got mixed blood. So that's your ductus venosus. There's a connection between your umbilical vein, which is arterial, right? It goes, uh, it's supposed to be what? The other way. So that closes. So that's your ductus venosus. Ductus arteriosus, ductus venosus. Now, let's look at the foramen, which means hole, valle, right? So if we look at the foramen of valley here, uh, where is it? It's a um, connection between your right atrium and your left atrium. Now, should there be a connection between my right atrium and my left atrium? No, because my adult circulation, right atrium is what? Deoxygenated. Left atrium is oxygenated. So you can see all the baby, everything's kind of like backwards or mixed, uh, mixed blood. But the second baby starts crying, there's gonna be a reverse in pressures. So the ductus arteriosus will close, ductus venosus here will close, and your foramen of valley. Now, if any one of these three things don't close, don't you can can you easily see how babies get what they call blue baby syndrome? When a baby is born, they should be what? Nice, bright, and pink, right? No matter what color they are, right? And especially if you can't tell, what do you do? Inside mucosa, this, it's supposed to be what? Full of blood, but uh, my goddaughter, Cora, she had uh, patent ductus arteriosus. So when she was born, she was blue, I like the shirt. Mommy freaked out. Um, thank goodness I put my boy Cam, I, even though it was in my delivery room, Cam was like, he goes, I saw my other babies and I go, not this one, out. Oh, come on, man, I'm like, out. So, uh, he broke down outside when he saw what his baby looked like because he had two other kids prior, nice and pink. And Cora, since she didn't have a lot of oxygen, was small. Cam is one of the biggest Asians you'll ever meet. So he was expecting big kids like his other two. Now he's like really small and looks in this color. Mommy's freaking out, everyone's freaking out. Who doesn't freak out? Us, right? 
And I, I don't know why me and my wife, my wife gets me into things. I wanted to be in the hallway with, with my boy Cam because he was freaking out at the very beginning. So you can now easily see pathology when these things uh, don't close right. Let's look at this. We already talked about this, what HCG does to estrogen, progesterone. What else? Do, uh, what other things are we going to have? Placental lactogen. What does lactose mean? What sugar is that? It's milk sugar. So placental lactogen, right? When the placenta comes out, what is it going to tell the breast and mammary disc? Drink milk. And that's why we want mommy and baby. Mom, baby needs that colostrum, needs those antibodies. Colostrum is the first milk that comes out. Another thing that happens, right? The corpus luteum and the placenta, right? The placenta is now going out. The corpus luteum is already on its way out as well. What's it going to do? Remember oxytocin? Does oxytocin ever turn off? No. Remember last term? Oxytocin only means what? On, 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 on. There's no off button for oxytocin. So there has to be an off button. And the off button is called relaxing. It's the hormone relaxing. It fights oxytocin, right? And then oxytocin will be on, on, on. Relaxing will be what? Off, off, off. Also, here's the other, it goes, here's the other, so the other issues. Relaxing doesn't kick in. Just imagine with all that blood loss, imagine uh, not only pain, your, um, uh, your uterus keeps on squeezing and there's a lot of blood loss already. Aldosterone, we already know what aldosterone does. Parathyroid hormone, we already know what parathyroid hormone does. And you can see it's important because, how's this? Mommy just had baby. Will the RAA system be increased or decreased? Decrease. How's mommy's blood pressure? It's down because, and blood volume, down, right? Salt, right? It's what? All the flushed out of it. Now what's gonna happen? Now what has to kick in? Aldosterone. And placental lactogen is kicking in. So who else also has to kick in? Parathyroid hormone. Also, you need calcium to do what? Jumpstart your heart, jumpstart your cardiovascular all over again. Because she just went through an ordeal. That ordeal for primary gravid mothers can be up to 14 hours. That's normal. Okay? So this stuff makes sense. I like this slide. Doesn't it look chock full of nice questions? Mm, that's right. Yummy. So if you're watching this video, pause oh, here. <laughs> uh, growth of uterus, yada, yada, yada. Um, you'll learn this, all this stuff in obstetrics because what this slide is saying is when mommy is pregnant, who's the most important thing in the world? Baby. Right? And anatomically and physiologically takes over baby right um i had uh, another professor she uh when she um she's here actually when she uh lectures like obstetrics things she calls the fetus the periscope <laughs> because she's got four kids of her own and she's a physician right because if the fetus then takes over and all the hormones are now for who baby or mommy baby everything's for baby and the second everything's done what happens it all comes back to mommy. And that's why mommy has a lot of issues with uh, postpartum depression and postpartum uh, uh, physiologic symptoms because it's real. Just imagine the, the second you the second you had fertilization, I took all your hormones and shook it up, right? And then when you gave birth, I took all your hormones again and then shake it up. So what's gonna happen? All the signals are gonna be all out of whack. There was a time, I know I'm your typical male, I used to think that a lot of postpartum depression was psychosomatic until I saw my own wife go through it. She went through it with our, sec with our second child. And she's a, for lack of a better term, she's a strong woman. And for her to watch her break down for six weeks, and then it went, then went away as quick as it came. That was that. I've had other patients, a uh, year, they were on meds. So again, and it, remember, hormones control a whole bunch of things. Anyone ever kept a diary when you were a kid? Read it now as an adult. It's hilarious. 
Like I just told them that it's an paper. Oh, and I I'm professional sure. Why? It's funny. You get to she look at all this stupidity. Like I wrote a diary in medical school, and me and my kids, when we were bored, we read it. It's it's hilarious. There's like moments like there's like moments I want to kill myself. There's other moments where I want to kill other people, and then there's other moments where I want to kill patients. There's a lot of killing going on in my mind, especially on third and fourth year. And it's funny to see because those were all what stressors. Stressors make what cortisol make what hormones. Oh, almost all. Almost all my things for fourth year medical school all started like this. I'm sick again. I have an upper respiratory. I have a lower respiratory. Why? Cortisol. I'm in massive amounts of stress. So isn't it any wonder I was sick the entire third and fourth year of medical school? No wonder. <laughs> Labor, birth canal, we all know that. Oxytocin, we know. And oxytocin is the only positive feedback that we know. Remember. Contraction of the uterus is on, 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 on. There's no off button. What is the only off button towards this positive feedback is relaxin. So oxytocin, squeeze uterus, relaxin, you know, uh, tells the uterus to stop or relax. Lever, birth canal, placenta, afterbirth. And you can see here, you can see how it's all geared for baby what? We go now. See the uterus, how it's intimately, I mean, uh, the uterus is intimate with the placenta. So this stuff coming out either early or late is never a good thing. And it has to come out complete. Let's see if they have a picture of me. No, they don't. I'll show you an anatomy. And like I said, it looks kind of like a meat pie. If you've ever, if you ever had like, you know, to me it looks like a pizza because it looks like puzzle pieces. So you can eat, not easily, but if you've seen enough of them, you could see if there's a piece missing. And definitely, if your patient is still considerably bleeding per vagina after the evacuation of the placenta, investigate. Even if it looks complete, all it takes is, is a little piece and you get something called DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. It's what happens when mommy's bleeding out so much that she uses up all her platelets. If mommy uses up all her platelets, what's going to happen to mommy? She'll bleed out and she'll die in minutes. And we get very, very excited about that because, and the bucket, everyone saw, you know, the bed, it transforms, right? The middle thing comes out and then it turns into like a basin, a metal basin. And then there's a bucket underneath. Not fill out that bucket and make sure you look at its contents because after when it's all done, when I got to put a line in mommy, we measure the blood in there. So we need so we need to know, you know, what am I remember, what's the function of a nurse? It has to know all the inputs, all the outputs. So because I have to know all the outputs so that when I get orders later, right? And I'm in the obstetrics. Because mommy goes to obstetrics, baby, if everything's okay, they get first checked out by neonatology. If neonatology clears them, baby goes to pediatrics. So mommy and baby are what? Separate wards, even though they hang out together as much as they can. How do you know that the orders that I put regarding her line are right are there? That's why I hate when there's change of shift. If let's say change of shift is what, 5.30 a.m., I deliver a baby at 4 a.m. If you don't do endorsements right and you don't tell the morning people what's going on, how many times I by 8 a.m., mommy's all puffed up because she's overhydrated. Who did that to her? Well, the endorsements were made right. So what do they do? Oh, it looked like she had a lot, a lot of blood loss without talking to the people actually there. But you'll see how endorsements, how they get all messed up real easy. Placental lactogen, we already know. Colostrum, we already know. And what's really important about colostrum? I can simulate everything else in the laboratory except what? Antibodies. Uh, milk reflex, uh, oxytocin, prolactin. Prolactin, of course is signals the milk leak down, uh, um, milk let down reflex. And it's not only suckling, because once mommy, especially if mommy is used to baby, um, uh, those of you who, uh, who are breastfeeding your children, have you ever like, oh, I finally got a night out, and then you hear somebody else's baby? By the very fact that you hear somebody else's baby, I remember, it was, I didn't hang out with my wife, a couple of kids. So it's probably had to be the first or fourth kid. And uh, me and my wife were at an event, and then there were kids at the event, 
And my wife goes back to him, I gotta go home. And then her shirt's wet. And I go, I go, oh, who did that to you? And, I, and she was like, and she goes, you. And then she walked out of the room. And I didn't get it because I thought one of the rugrats killed Jesus or whatever. Then I realized, goes, why is everyone here? I'm like, oh. And she was pissed because it was a really, really nice silk dress. And I go, well, you're the one who wants to hang out with me, so your fault is as well. Postnatal, remember, what do we have to watch out for? All the hormones. So everything that changed before it gave birth are going to rechange after. So these are the things you have to watch out for. And it's also the reason why. You guys notice, for those of you who remember your um, obstetric visits, right? You still have obstetric visits after, right? It's not only enough that I have to check the stitches and check all the stuff down here. I'm also checking how you're feeling, how you're eating. Because remember we talked about pica, all the hormones messed up your food, right? My wife, before she had kids, like never liked anything spicy. Remember what also controls um, taste? Hormones, right? Now my wife has to have like the most fiery food ever. I guess that's what five kids will do to you, right? Because why? The changes. Now, these are minor changes, but do you think there'll be some significant physiologic changes? Yeah, could be. So you gotta watch out for them. And we also wanna check up on baby as well. Neonatal period, infancy, childhood, adolescence, and senescence. That's at end of adulthood. So when someone, right, right now, all of us, even myself included, like death is the last thing on our mind. Right? Like, what, what, do we ever really think about, oh, I'm gonna die today. But when you talk to your parents, talk to your grandparents, ones who are in their 80s, they think about it, what, a lot, right? Um, and that's called senescence. When you kind of know that your days are, you know, uh, um, and how about this? Can you have senescence when you're young? Yeah. Um, um, my cousin, I already shared with you guys, she already has end-stage breast cancer. She already made her peace with it. But for the last year, she's going through all the senescence stuff, like, you know, okay, how am I going to go out? What am I going to do? Uh, you know, uh, who's going to take care of my cat? That kind of thing, right? And it's also part of the life cycle, but it has also significant um, uh, um, psychiatric things that you should go deal with. And same thing with um, some mommies like, oh, I just want to get back to work. You sure? You have leave for a reason. Take some time. Be with your child. I'm all, I'm, when I was in obstetrics, I was always telling that, like, mommy, you don't have to go back to work this week. Oh, by the way, what do they always tell? Oh, what do they always tell mommy? Oh, no, daddies. When dad, because mommies never ask. But daddy's always asked, like, oh, doc, you know, when can you ask? Right? Coitus. You can have coitus, like, in a week or two. Right? Once everything's healed up, yeah, go right ahead. But what do we always tell mommy and daddy? Six to eight weeks. Right? I'm, I go, because why? Right? She went, went to, she, went to all, she went through an ordeal. And then, and then what? To be pregnant all over again? Right? To be that? So it's one of those things where, you know, some of them, you, you like, so instead of like a more five than a six, how many of me husbands like, come on, doc, six, that's not a lot. I'm like, mm, make it eight, make it ten. How's make that? It three miles. <laughs> <laughs> make it for like nine years. <laughs> no, with her complications, it should be a year. So mother's like, <laughs> but then miraculously, what happens? Pregnant. Nine months, they're back and go, um, I like the little, you know, the little Filipino man. And I'm, I'm not an obstetrics anymore. And they're like, Who's calling me? He goes, oh, this is pregnant lady in ER. And I go, what am I? Goes, because I told you, I delivered a lot, right? So go, yeah, 20 hours. I come down. I had uh, four repeats out of the 60 some odd. So I had four repeats in my career where I just delivered, not even nine months later. They're like, they're in ER. And then the computer says, pulls my name up. So obstetrics goes, Hey Nelson, come down here. I've got a repeat customer. I'm like, I have cousins that are the same age, but the mother. My Uh, um, my friend, uh, uh, he's from Puerto Rico, so I guess his little racist comment is okay if you're Puerto Rican, right? He goes, oh, they're called Puerto Rican twins. So when my sister heard that, then my sister took a good look at both of our ages, 
Like we're only 10 months apart. And then, and I was born seven months premature, so it's who's up. It's me, girls. Right? So my, my, uh, my, uh, my sister says we're Filipino twins. And her pregnancy was super good, no problem. I was in an incubator for what, like five months? Uh, cardiovascular changes we already went through. Fourth week. Now, have you guys ever seen babies with teeth? Right? Don't be freaked out because again, right? Sometimes the bone development uh, is, is a little fast or not. It's just kind of freaky seeing like newborns with teeth. Um, remember, there is something called the social smile. If you look at babies and then, you know, you know, they're eating or they're feeding and they fart or whatever, right? And then they smile. That's not the social smile. The social smile is the one, the smile that is consistent and it's typically reacting towards mommy's face, right? So if they're looking at me, right? And the baby like, eh, it looks like it's smiling. It's, 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 it's but if they're looking at mommy, that's the social smile we're looking for. And <clears throat> remember, you're gonna have um, you're gonna have development classes and future nursing classes. You gotta memorize the course. You gotta memorize when this stuff happens because clinically, did, who do you think picks up autistic kids or, or 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 developmental? There's a lot of developmental delay. You think there's a lot of autistic kids? There's a lot of developmental delay. When I first started education. In a class of 400, I had one IEP. You know there's almost one IEP in almost every class in this joint? We're not the only ones because, of, number one, we're getting more sophisticated in looking for developmental and learning disabilities. And also, number two, it's just, I don't know, thumbs up and somebody's uh, paying attention. Uh, special nutrition, we talked about that. Uh, childhood. Now, the thing also is, is speaking, reading, writing, and thinking in the childhood years, if it's early, it's not freaky. It's okay. If everything's early, it's okay. It's actually nice. It's when everything is late. Okay? Um, and uh, when you're looking at children, not only the, the way they climb stairs, there's certain weeks where you ever see little, like really little kids, the way they go upstairs, they only go up like one leg and one foot at a time, right? And then other little kids do what? They can run up uh, conversely. And then you got my kids who like jumping <laughs> whole flights of stairs. Because I saw a kid, he was playing Superman, he jumped like 20 stairs, right? And then I'm like, and my wife was like, me and my wife, everybody who was watching it flinched, except me and my wife. We were like, oh yeah, all my boys do that. All of them. And then, as if on cue, do, 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 bang. Uh, the, he was four at the time. Edison thought what? There's no snow outside, so let me get inside a uh, laundry basket full of clean laundry, my dirty butt, and slide down two flights of stairs. Right? Oh, by the way, cut himself. Now there's blood, all the clean clothes. Right? And that's the Darius family in a nutshell. And we're sitting there with the people, with the people, you know, we're just laughing with our, with, with our guests. And you're, do, 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 do. and you know, as parents, you know, bad thumps and good thumps. That was not a good thump. Sometimes you go, boom, like, mm. yeah, Nelson, I'm going hit his head again. And then no one's freaking out because they're not going to know what it is. And you, as parents, now, with the adolescents, uh, the thing about adolescence is, and you're going to learn um, what is called Piaget stages. Maybe you guys took um, a psychology course. Those stages, they're kind of old, but they still apply. And one of the greatest things that you're going to have to look at, and because it applies to you clinically, is um, like uh, um, early adolescence and, of course, uh, right after they become toddlers. You know how they say terrible twos? That's a load. Toddlers all throughout their toddlerdom, two, three, four, five, they're awful. Because Piaget talks about this thing called um, um, autonomy. You ever, you ever try to give meds to a five-year-old or a four-year-old? Because why? It's not that they're in any real pain or whatever. They even like the taste of the medication, right? But 
they want autonomy, they want to do it. And you, by the very fact that you're giving it to them, they'll fight you. And it's also the same thing from puberty to adulthood, adolescence. They know it's good for them, but then what will they do? They f I find my adolescent patients, sometimes they're very, they're, they're intractable when you tell them, okay, you gotta take this med this time, this time, this time. But again, you'll learn techniques to get through all that. So every stage, as you can see, has its own issues. And of course, adulthood, maturity, we're thinking more of what? What happens with, you know when they say like all downhill, but it isn't. But no one understands, but, but here's the thing. I, I still wake up, my mentality is still the same mentality when I was 24. Like I, I don't think my brain has um, matured in 25 years. So what do I what do I expect when I go to the gym or when I ride? Uh, I rode my mountain bike for the first time the other day. Man, going down the hill, wee, great. And then when you're going up the hill, I even put it down in the lowest gear possible. And then I have to walk it. You know how sad it is? You like walk it. You know, bike. You should, I used to go. I used to ride when I was a kid, 10, 15, 20 miles. It was all. It was okay. But what happens, especially if you don't train? Uh, even if you do train, uh, the other day, uh, uh, what is it, 100, um, 120 pounds bench? I had to, like, I had a, I'm like, I'm shaking, I'm like, kidding me? I'm a 14 year old can do that. And of course, senescence, remember, you kind of, you're going through all this time and trouble that you're um, decreasing um, physiologic function, and also the very fact that you know that, eh, you know, I'm not going to live forever. You're going to start thinking stuff. So that is also, uh, that's why it's also good. When you get to like this level, uh, that's why I love seeing older people who go um, who go back to school. That's my dream. I always want, I, could, I always want to learn how to play drums and do other stuff. That's my dream. So like when I, like, you know, maybe when I'm 80, go to a guitar center and get a set of drums. I don't know. But if any of you work as a CNA, if you look at the attitudes of the people who have dementia and don't have dementia, the ones who have dementia are stuck where? They're stuck in their youth and they never learned anything new, right? But those who are, you know, they're, they're still sharp, right? They're the ones who are like, oh, I wanna learn something new, right? Um, last time I did my rounds uh, with my wife um, for her healthcare administration program, she had to uh, be a pseudo manager for uh, an assisted living. And her job was, she's like, I go to college for this. Her job, there was like, um, it was like around Christmas time. So they wanted everyone to learn how to do bells. You know, like, you know, they, they sing songs. At first I'm like, oh, that, no one's gonna wanna do that, whatever. You know what? My wife rounded up 50 people and she was like, this is what we're gonna do. And it goes, we're gonna do bells, but the Zumba music. Because no one, no one was signing up for the thing. So, she adapted, she changed, and then did what? And now you have people who weren't moving, now moving. What happens to the mood when you don't move? Also, these, these plays are, um, um, she has to do what you guys have to do as well. But admin, they interview the patient for different reasons. You guys interview the patient, but it's almost a mesh, right? So it's actually kind of good that she had nursing training. Um, the one thing that I saw on all of her reports is a lot of them have family members, but you know, when your kids grow up, they got their own issues, right? And a lot of children have to go, even if you have a nuclear family, a lot of children got to go where the money is. So they may not be where you are, even though you're a nuclear loving family. So a lot of these people are what? Stuck alone. That's why um, uh, one thing big for nursing as well is uh, walking groups for patients who are ambulatory. Yeah, just walk around the facility. Why do you think Inova makes all their facilities look like malls? You ever notice that? Any facility that was made in the last 10 years for Inova or upgraded in the last 10 years, doesn't it look like a mall? It like has a Starbucks and it has a thing. It looks, acts, and feels like a mall. Even the marble, the glass. Take a good look at, at your environment. And why are they doing that? So that when people come there, what's their mind frame? A little bit different. Any of all remember, uh, those of you who are old enough to remember uh, hospitals in the 80s and 70s, they look like jails. 
Because I, I remember when I was a medical assistant in the 80s, it looked like jail. It wasn't fun. Life expectancy, yeah, yeah, you know. But let's end off with this. This thing was in 2014, almost what, eight, nine years ago. Hey, by the way, look up 2022 uh, statistics. Guess what's one, two, and three? Same exact thing. So does that mean we're getting we're getting any better at medicine? We're getting any any better? No. That and all of these things, chronic disease, cancer, and uh, lower respiratory stuff like COPD. Does it happen overnight? No. So what do we need to do? We need to get at our patient what earlier. I love that unintentional injuries. <laughs> you have injuries like oh, I meant to do. Like that guy who. Uh, you see that doctor who drove who drove him and his family yeah. in a Tesla oh, off a cliff, right. 250 feet. Not a very bright man, because if he was an EMS, he'd know 250 feet. I've seen a lot of survival and stuff like that. No, you gotta get Did he you know. Oh, they all survived, right? And uh, because he was because what? And then you look at him. Oh, he's got a really good life and all these things, right? And a great career. But if your head is on right, how you how useful is it all? Something to think about. And that's time. Oh, I went a whole 20 minutes over. Wow. That's a lot for me. How dare you. But remember, <laughs> class goes to one. So if anyone wants to hang out and uh, do anatomize, you can. The next five minutes. Yeah. And I'm going to videotape the gamification of it so we can put it on YouTube. Thank you.